All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, drug eluding stents and uh, really the utility in treating infringing disease. And this perhaps should have been titled the Holy Grail or Surge's Holy Grail, of which we haven't yet found it. So I don't have anything to disclose. So as you've heard from all of the morning talks and uh, really advances in technology have been remarkable in the evolution of endovascular therapies. And the problems of recentose in the SFA have occurred and continue despite re-engineering with new stent designs and materials, as well as new techniques and an addition of pharmacologic agents to limit restenosis. So this is the evolution of success, and I'm not sure that we've yet achieved it. So again, from the earlier morning talks, you've heard a variety of different techniques, and you've heard about uh, balloon angioplasty and scoring and atherectomy stents, drug eluding balloons, and we're really going to try and emphasize a little bit about where we are with drug coated stents, um, both some of the limitations and uh, perhaps some of the issues about the future. Now again, I know this is a bit redundant, but FEMPOP occlusive disease is, is common. It's greater than 50% of the peripheral lesions are located in this particular segment. Occlusions are much more common than stenoses in the SFA. And I think that's been one of the Achilles heel of the treatment modalities that we have. Patients are typically treated for claudication and exercise intolerance. Now the realities are that restenosis and reocclusions have been significant issues in this anatomical distribution. The initial technical success for balloon angioplasty was reported as quite good, however long-term durability was very limited, and the, these lesions typically were very short stenoses. And the early reported studies and the impact of stents were variable, and in many cases were less than optimal. So this was the ideal lesion, something that uh, none of us ever see anymore. Um, this is a much more typical SFA disease pattern. So I'm trying to set the stage for the reality and the anatomic realities of what we're, what we're trying to achieve. Patency for SFA angioplasty, obviously very old data, but you can see both primary and secondary patency, not very good. Again, patency for SFAs after percutaneous angioplasty. These were very average length lesions. Now the stents have provided scaffolding to overcome dissection and recoil and have allowed for improved luminal results. Stents unfortunately cause inflammation, leading to instant restenosis. They alter the normal vasal motion. They inhibit favorable late-term remodeling, and they often require aggressive antiplatelet therapy. So stents have resulted in improved short-term results, but have limitations for longer-term durability. So these are pictures that no one wants to see. Obviously, severe restenosis and subsequent occlusion following stenting. Now, there is an a evolutionary phase, and you can see in the late 2000s, FAST, Vienna, the stenting superior to PTA. 2008, the resilient trial completed with one-year data. Um, 2010, we pub published resilient in circulation interventions. And current expectations were that 81% one-year patency lesions up to 15 centimeters. And then in 2013, we had the Zilver PTX became the first approved drug eluding stent in the United States. Again, graphically just showing the variability, comparing restenosis rates. And at the end, you'll note there, Scirocco, uh, the Control Smart, and the Fast Elution. And again, these were some early uh, attempts at drug eluding uh, stent platforms that were disappointingly, uh, had disappointing results, uh, period. Um, the, again, contemporary trials with SFA, and you can see the Zilver there, 12-month um, primary patency, Scirocco, um, with DES, the resilient, the life stent, and gives you a sense of where we are both with the, the non-drug eluding and the drug eluding stents. So consequences of stent fracture, and the reason this is important, this may be one of the considerations in why Scirocco didn't do better, that it may not have been just the drug elution but, or, the, or, the, or the pharmacologic therapy that was chosen, but rather stent design features. So what have we learned from the available data? We know that the ideal case for infraingual innervation intervention is a focal lesion of less than 10 centimeters. We know that stents improve the initial and short-term results. Stent fractures are a bad thing. They contribute to poor outcomes. Covered stents don't perform much better. And then the unique anatomical features of the SFA related to vasal motion do present a significant impediment to stent design. So this basically highlights kind of the milieu that we're faced with and how, how we deal with this. So clearly the problem with the SFA is that it's a vessel that's surrounded by two flexion points, often has few collaterals, 
occlusions are common and they outweigh stenosis and the various adductor canal and flow dynamics associated with it. So what is it that we hope to do? Well, we hope to optimize acute outcomes. We hope to improve long-term vessel patency, to allow for optimal treatment for more difficult lesion subsets, and to overcome the difficult anatomy and access issues. So there have been multiple approaches. So these are the multiple kinds of agents that have multiple actions that have been used anti-inflammatories, anti-proliferative, migration inhibitors, or those that actually promote healing and re-endothelialization. Now, drug coatings, how they work, historical principles of drug delivery, the sustained, sustained drug exposure is essential to restenosis inhibition, the residual time is as important as the dose determining clinical benefit, and PTX dose cannot exceed cytotoxic thresholds. By contrast, with when we put it on a balloon, there's a brief bolus delivery. The acute therapy does not transfer, which, uh, which appears above cytotoxic thresholds, and the histopath data shows favorable vascular healing. So how do we reconcile high drug transfer levels and favorable vascular response? How can a drug delivery achieve the sustained drug ex exposure necessary for efficacy? So these are some of the engineering realities of it. Carriers. So a lot has been done in the engineering world with carriers and the molecule governs how the total drug load is required for a balloon or stent, peak drug dose and the drug half-life in the arterial wall, What's the downstream effect, you know, downstream drug loss during the balloon transient inflammation, or inflation rather, and then the coating durability in, un, in un, uniformity. The, these were the polymer uh, uh, drug eluding stent results. Um, they were actually very disappointing. You can see the sirolimus 29.2 versus bare metal um, with strides, a days post index procedure. Again, um, primary patency was really not uh, uh, not what we expected, and not better than the than the uh, the non-coated or plain uh, stents. Um, um, there is some differences between drug or drug-coated balloons and drug-loaded stents. The total Paxil dose and the drug-coated balloon-treated porcine arteries um, in blue, and then in red, the remaining in tissue after removal of a stent scaffold. So there is an importance of carrier transfer, and I'm not going to go belabor this, but the ideal drug load balloon stent design would be a highly efficient carrier that facilitates transfer of therapeutic tissue dose with minimal downstream loss. And again, this is just from some of the balloon trials, and you, you clearly have demonstrated from previous speakers that they appear to work. Well. What's the conceptual advantage of drug-coated balloons and stents? Well, there's a class effect. Drug delivery to de de deep layers after single contact. No, uh, with a balloon, there's no permanent implantable prosthesis. But again, you, d you also lose the scaffolding that's uh, helping to, to maintain uh, uh, initial luminal size. Um, and th th so far, they've had accepted safety, safety profile. The cost at this point is unknown, and obviously there's more comparative data that needs to be done. When we specifically look at stenting, and again, from Scirocco, both Scirocco 1, 2, and the longer term, again, um, the long term, uh, there was actually with, with strides, it was not beneficial, I mean, sorry, with Scirocco, it was not beneficial. With strides, the long term benefit was in question, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Zilver in a minute. Um, and again, I won't belabor all of this. Unfortunately, these were using a, this was a polymer type uh, uh, coating on a, with cerulimus based uh, pharmacologic agent. And there are lots of problems with this. There may very well have been premature stent fractures and other things that led to this. So to some extent, the stent platform may have been suboptimal. But needless to say, this uh, uh, did not show, uh, show benefit over bare metal stent, as you can see here. Um, and again, strides, uh, again, a uh, similar sort of concept. Um, initial uh, uh, short-term results were quite good. The longer-term results really weren't any better than, than the bare metal stents. Now, Zilver, um, this is a nitinol Zilver stent. This is what's currently available, uh, uh, approved in the United States, as an outer surface coated with uh, Paxitaxel. Um, uh, three micrograms per uh, millimeter squared. There's no polymer or binder on this particular agent. For your freedom from TLR, the Zilver PTX for standard care um, clearly showed a benefit and a, at the three-year marked reduction in TLR of 45%. 
the single arm results were consistent with the randomized controlled trial um, uh, demonstrating the benefit of the Zilver PTX. Um, the, this is the data from Zeller, and again, this was referred to in some of the earlier talks, the treatment of instant restenosis with paxotaxel eluting stent. Um, actually, the, some of this uh, data was really very good, patency of ni almost 96% at six months and just under 80% at 12 months. Uh, so it clearly has a demonstrated benefit, however, it's still, uh, uh, still not perfect. Um, you know, that there is, a, I think, to some extent, as we go through all of this data, there is some a question of a choice between drug-coated coated balloons and drug uh, stents. Uh, it's not clear. There's clearly a lack of data currently and no direct comparisons. There are different metrics that have been utilized, variable populations, unknown costs, and uh, with regard to patient preferences and sensitivities. Um, and I think the real question comes down to is it, a, you know, you're implanting a permanent device with a stent uh, versus the balloon. The clinical limitations of uh, obviously the drug-coated balloons and stents is that there's inadequate for many long calcified occlusive lesions. The dogma, you have to predilate. And again, I sh showed you some of the earlier data, as did other speakers, with regard to TLR rates um, at two years. The stents, and I think, again, the primary limitation is it requires a stent platform that's subject to mechanical issues, including fracture, negative remodeling, and then ongoing vessel inflammation or inflammatory response. And then again, there's also no definitive strategy um, for instant restenosis, as you've uh, obviously garnered from the many uh, the live cases that we've seen today. There's a different approach, and clearly it's a... Uh, 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 we still have limited technology to deal with that. Um, there are some regulatory limitations, um, um, and actually this is uh, um, somewhat dated now. The Zilver PTX is actually no longer on recall and is available. But finally, I just would mention a cost-benefit analysis, and one of the things we haven't talked much about here on the panel, cost-benefit analysis will determine success and failure of these new technologies. Consumers, government, third-party payers will demand outcomes data to determine clinical efficacy. And again, you, you know, if you look at what the cost of these are, balloons are relatively cheap, uh, a little more expensive are nitinol stents and lasers, that sort of thing. And then atherectomy, drug-coated balloons and drug-coated stents are significantly more expensive. The evolution of technology and devices, uh, clearly drug delivery via these uh, balloon stents or absorbable stents does hold promise to reduce restenosis. The primary technical difficulty is to get an initial adequate luminal result and avoid the negatives of leaving behind a stent that impacts negatively on vasomotion and the favorable remodeling that can take place. Drug eluting stents have shown promise, but there are many unanswered questions. Initial reductions in TLR and their use for instant restenosis have, however, been clearly demonstrated. And I, I'll stop there, and I thank you very much for your attention.